Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined again today by James Carville, who needs no introduction, obviously, a great uh, campaign manager, a political strategist, a lifelong Democrat, uh, but very fine commentator and fair commentator about American politics in general. Uh, we've done two conversations uh, with James, which both stand up well from 20, early 2021 and then uh, just the beginning of this year, January 2023. Uh, which you can look back at as well. And uh, but James, thanks for thanks for joining me again. I always love to do it. Good to well, thank, you. thank you. No, it's great to have you. Okay, so let's just well, here we are. It's an election. Right. It's the past Labor Day. The election campaign is officially shows how old I am that I think that like Labor Day means something about the beginning of the election campaign. But still, right. it is sort of the beginning, right? The year before and then the year of. So, past Labor Day, twenty twenty three. What? Um, how do we stand? I mean, let's begin with Trump. You would was sort of hopeful, I guess, I look back at the January 2023 conversation that he might face some real opposition. There might be, people might be getting tired of him on the Republican side. Not so much, huh? No, not not yet. And that's an important qualifier. But I, I'll make one factual point. If this election was this November, okay, I know it's not, but assume that it was, and candidates for Joe Biden, Democrat, Donald Trump, the Republican, Joe Manchin, Larry Hogan, no labels, and Cornell West. Biden would be an betting underdog. That's just a fact. There's nobody that would dispute that at all. And that would be a catastrophic result for the country. I think we can easily say that. So, uh, there's a, a lot of there's a lot of banana peels out there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, Leave it at that, you know, that, you know, people can slip on. But that's where we are right now, September 13th, uh, the year before the election. That assumes a Trump-Biden race. Well, let's just go through it. What are the banana? So you think, what could happen to derail Trump on the Republican side? If you, you've, oh, you're, you're always imaginative about these things. Is, is this So there's a sense that if, nothing, if something doesn't happen in the next three weeks, it's impossible. That's not true. Okay, I know there was a time Clinton announced like October the 10th of 1991. Lyndon Johnson was running for president of March 1st, 1968. So we're going to have Elaine Kamark on our podcast a week from tomorrow. And she is the, literally, she's the authority. She's the fourth edition of the delegate selection. So if, if something happened in We'd have a nominee, okay? <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a thing, but there's there's not a, a deadline that you pass that you can't have one. I, it would be difficult. Uh, it would be all of these things, but it, 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 something can happen. Uh, Trump, and I know his numbers hold up; they got stronger. There's some evidence. I don't want to jump on it too far that they're beginning to weaken a little bit, uh, particularly in Iowa. And, you know, Bill, there's a, there, there's a tipping point in all of this. And sometimes, it, and, you know, it's like, what did Lenin say? History can go decades with nothing happening, and then it right. can go weeks with decades happening. No, I mean, I it's that. not I a linear. That. I love that comment. One of the few right. things Lenin said that I really like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did, he did call left left wing is an infantile uh, <laughs> disorder I, I i gave that book to bill moore <laughs> is that... I, I said lennon couldn't take this goddamn woke people i get you how can you and i expect to take them <laughs> I, th I think the dictate wasn't him but i think the dictatorship of the proletariat is the best slogan in the history of politics <laughs> yeah i guess so that's a real pro, one pro admiring another there that's good right 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 so he's fading. Yeah, I agree. He's, he seems to have topped out, at least in the, in the Republican polls for a while, and a little weaker in Iowa. Do you buy the argument? Well, two things, I guess. What about all the indictments and trials? Does that stuff make a difference? A. And B, do you buy the argument that our friend Mike Murphy is sort of sticking with that, like in the old days, what happens in Iowa, the actual vote in Iowa matters a ton for the what happens in the subsequent states, Iowa and New Hampshire? And then Iowa tends to move kind of late. So, you know, we, we can't look at a national poll today and say the Republican race is over. So th this is, if you're a Trump person, highly likely all you know are other Trump people. 
Therefore, you have a hard time digesting the election result. How could we lose? You know, it was a famous Pauline Kael quote. How, how could right. McGovern lose? Everybody I knew was for him. Or the, the, the woman at the Dallas Country Club. I don't understand how Goldwater could have lost. Everybody at the club was for him. Right. All right. And, and we all live in our own information bubble, if you will. Now, what happens is uh, uh, other voters weigh in. So if he doesn't do that well in Iowa, it's not Bill Crystal or James Carville or the New York Times or, 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 you know, corporate media saying something. This is other people just like them. And that has a lot, a lot more credibility. And so, well, what are these people in Iowa? Do they look like me? Do they act like me? They go to church like I do. What did they see? So that's that's an important tipping point. The other thing is, in, everybody says the same thing. People have enormous faith in juries. You can say it's a Washington, D.C. jury or it's a, this jury. Uh, but jurors are kind of all the same. All right, in a Washington, D.C. jury, if, if they decide something, that that's going to affect public opinion much more than an editorial or, you know, a talking head. And, and he's got some of that to go through. And they will sense there's something serious here. Yeah, that's probably a little more of a general election problem because the trials don't begin, it looks like, until March or so. But, Ooh, but, well, but maybe yeah, not. What if, it, maybe what if not. he's convicted in May? Started, right? Yeah. You know, you don't know. And it, what about, we'll suppose that uh, the uh, chess bar is convicted in right. October or November and people start pleading. And uh, there's, there's just there's so much football left to play here. Is it likely that he guts this out and he rallies him and he becomes a nominee? It may be likely, but not not much more than that, I don't think. Okay, well, that's fair. I think that's helpful. It's a good caution against everyone wants right. to call races. You and I have been through this so many times. People want to call races, you know, 14 months early, right, based right. on four polls. Yeah. And, you know, President so. Giuliani. <laughs> exactly, Right. Hillary right. in 2008, right. 2007, okay. 2008. Sure, right. Two thousand about 2016. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. Right, yeah, okay, that's okay. Let's not even think about that. Right. You were, but yeah, I right. want to say, for the record, you and I, I can't think we did a speech probably together somewhere in October 2016. I don't know if you remember this. And you were worried. You were right. worried about, about Hillary, and you were worried about their campaign strategy and the fact that Hillary hadn't set foot in Wisconsin and was giving up on small town voters and so forth. So I give you, I yeah. always... Tell that's I always give you credit for that. You know, you weren't you drinking know, the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I think a lot in my mind, wonders a lot. And I think, you know, suppose I'm a, was a, like a German soldier in World War One, and I'm, uh, I, you know, born in 1898. And it's 1937. I have an apartment in Berlin and a motorcade is coming. And, you know, I got a pretty good shot. And I got him, and, you know, I could squeeze the trigger, and I said, well, maybe the industrials in Berlin or, the, you know, the younger general <laughs> staff will control him, and I'll probably miss, and it'll make him stronger. And there's a 12-knot crosswind, and, I, you know, I'm a little rusty. You, know, you don't pull the trigger, all right? And in, in September of 2016, uh, I I knew, and as did other people, knew that this thing wasn't going very well, that the messaging was kind of screwed up. And every time you'd call them, they'd say, well, analytics says yes. Well, I don't know how you argue. I know how to argue with Jeff Garrett. I know how to argue with Jim Gerstein or John Anzalone. I do not know how to argue with analytics because it's a it's some creation of, of, of it's so authoritative. And, you know, people would say, well, look, you go talk and, you know, I'm not going in there. And. If I probably, and I said, well, if I do, it's probably not going to work. There are going to be this massive pushback. Is always oh, the white boys are trying to take over again. Uh, you know, I'm in the sixth tier of influence, and my kids can go to the White House Christmas party. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm lucky and not, I don't want to take it out. It's too much trouble, and it probably wouldn't work anyway. But if we would have. It, it would have caused wholesale disruption. I don't think they were looking for that. And again, it probably wouldn't have worked, but I still wonder if I, I should have tried. 
I, you know, you just look. Yeah, I'm not. I can't tell you that I stay up late at night and have nightmares about it. But but I think about it, you know. And I'm well, sure the guy that, that 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 didn't squeeze the trigger said, "Yeah, maybe I should have." <laughs> but you may. I think you made your views known privately to some degree. And you're you're about one one thousandth as culpable as all the Republican elites, obviously, who haven't squeezed maybe, the trigger but, for you know, for eight right. years, and and so and many other people. You were you were basically right. And I had the impression you and some of your colleagues uh, made that case privately. But anyway, to get back to 2023. Um, well, let's just talk that about. I mean, you said that you thought if the election were held now or right. this November, uh, Biden's a slight underdog. I mean, what about the Democrats? So, what about the Biden okay. question? It's it, it's it's obviously a relevant question. And so, when I taught, I used to tell my students, "It got to understand this. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters that you think." Hmm. And so, you and I experience that this. We actually, unlike most people, have. A, fair idea of what the job entails. And we also have, unfortunately, a fair idea of what old age entails. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we bring a, a, like it or not, maybe. So let's forget about what we think. All right. That's not the question here. We know what the public thinks. And the public does not like this. Not, not by a little bit. By like three quarters. And what this democracy could do, and you know, you hear this, these are, uh, you know, you're at the Cosmos Club and they mumble shit like rule of law and uh, institutions and guardrails and, you know, the democracy. Well, shit, what do you got to give people a choice for a democracy to succeed? People got to get a choice that they, that at least half the people like. And, and right now, Three quarters of the country does not like the choice that they're being presented with. Could it change? Yeah, but could. So the White House theory is this. I hear it a thousand times a day. Reagan was 42 in August of 1983. Clinton was in the toilet in August of 1995. Obama was down. And it takes a while, James, for these recoveries to take hold. And people are going to see this, and it, it's it, the almighty versus the alternative. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but the alternative is not the most inspired campaign message I've ever heard in my life, but okay. <laughs> and I can be critical. But suppose it doesn't get better. All right? That's that's a possibility. And the, the really... If I, if you can give me two minutes here. Please, please. This is an important point. The Democratic numbers, Biden's numbers among the two constituencies that the Democrats have to do well, not not carry them, but that the what what a political what I think about is share a vote. All right. So blacks the, the turnout among blacks since Biden has been elected has been abysmal. And it's been abysmal everywhere. It's the most underreported story in American politics today. And I keep screaming about it. And I think people think it's racist to say we have low black turnout. It's just the opposite. We're not connecting with the most important constituency in the Democratic Party. Young people are decidedly unenthusiastic. That that Harvard poll was good. I want to get that guy on the podcast. I, I, I have this. You know, as soon as somebody says Harvard and politics, I have this immediate like, nah, that guy did that's good. A good. That's, that's a healthy. That's a healthy reaction. Right. right. Say. Yeah. I, 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 but that guy, <laughs> Della Volpe, yeah. they, they, their stuff is good. I yeah. mean, I've, I've started highly skeptical and looked through it and, and I've talked to other people and the young people are not enthusiastic at all. So we were talking share, the, the black share population. Black share should be 12. I think that's right. I could be slightly off, but it should be 12. The under 30 share should be 17. So if the black share is 11 and the under 30 share is 15, you say, well, you lost three points on constituencies that you're going to get in it, probably two thirds of one and 93% of the other. Bam, wrong answer. It costs you a lot more than that. Because remember, on election day, it has to add up to 100. So if my black share is down and my new share is down, another share has to go up. It can't. It, it, it's always 100 on Election Day. And unfortunately, the, the share that is likely to go up 
are non-college whites over 60. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. You're not, so maybe they should be 30% of the share. Now, don't, don't, don't call me to that. I'm going to go back and look. But if they come in at 32, yeah. that's a lot. So you lose and two-thirds, you, in a yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. on you, both, you on each, each both, of the two each, or three each, Exactly. Yeah. It yeah. has to, it is the most fundamental law of politics that is is hard to grasp. It has to add up to 100. It's not going to be 47 to 46 on election day. Right. It can't. It, the, uh, it, uh, equally true is the third parties are going to be a, a, a pretty decent drain on Biden. And don't forget Cornell West. Right. And he's a much, I, I've watched him on TV, and he's got a stick, and it's not bad. And he's very, oh, you know, I, you know, my brother Carville, and uh, yeah, we, 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 the people have to have an alternative, and we've been caught in the same doom loop. And yeah, I mean, and in his chief backer is Jill Stein, who got more votes than Hillary, lost by in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, who was a complete creature of the Kremlin. Please Google. Jill Stein, Vladimir Putin, Judge, General Flynn photograph. And the Kremlin's going to be all over this. Right. Uh, I, that, I mean, that's not, that's hardly a secret. And, and the, you know, the, the, the no labels people, they might take some, but it's going to be mostly Republicans who can't stand Trump that just can't pull themselves to vote for a Democrat, but would probably get most of them that voted without no labels. And so that, that, that's all a danger. I mean, that's, that's real danger. That, that's not made up beltway democratic. So Jim was seen as a friend of mine. So I think Democrats need to quit bedwetting. I said, my wife has me on rubber sheets right now. I don't know if I'm a bedwetter or not, but I sleep with a life preserver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you see national polls that are 46, 46, 43, 43, several reputable polls. Then you see um, Demo two-thirds of the country doesn't want Biden and Trump, and two-thirds of Democrats think Trump is too old. It's not, I don't think it's bedwetting so, at that point, you know? Remember in in... I, I, people will say the CNN poll had too many Republicans. Okay, I, I thought, but every other poll is the same. They don't change. That, and this has been going on since May. I think I looked at an ABC poll. It, of course, just having seen so many polls, I've, I've, I've been, uh, kinda, I have a kind of, I try to look at things more optimistically than, say, the average person in politics. And every time I tried to find something to be optimistic about, it was catastrophic. I said, well, maybe our enthusiasm is better. No. Maybe Trump's very unfavorable is higher than Biden's very unfavorable. Not really. All right. I, I, it, you know, every little data point you try to eke out to say there's a payout. The only thing that the Biden high command would say is right now we're getting, you know, 15% of the voters who's they say we don't we have a bad job approval or something. Okay. That but that that that, that you remember you gotta add up to a hundred on election day. The yeah, so I mean the two counter arguments that we've both heard so often and they're not ridiculous is uh too risky and too late. The primary would be a mess, who knows who'd be nominated, Biden beat Trump, you're just willing to roll the dice. That's that's too just too day it's riskier than running than the risk of running an 82 year old. That's the kind of comparative risk <laughs> analysis, right. if you want. So too risky. Then, we'll, then we can get to maybe it's too late now. This was a good argument yeah. when you made it back in January. Right. Let me let me put upon a very important number. And I guess it was the CNN poll. All right. Everything trial heats kind of 48, 40, whatever. There's one number that sticks out. If it was Nikki Haley in Biden, Biden's at 43. I don't know if I've ever seen an incumbent. At 43. So if it's Biden, Trump, it's 48. I don't know. It's, it's what you, which every other poll has. But as soon as you interject something different, it's six points. And that's one poll. It might be an outlier. I got, but, but you, 
you're going to see more than that. I would, you know, you, you would like to see validation before you jump on that. But I thought that was a really significant number. Uh, and you could see somebody coming up and, you know, the, the lack of enthusiasm. Now, the only people that are enthusiastic are the Trump people. That's it. The, the Democrats are not enthusiastic. The, the non-Trump Republicans are depressed. And, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of stuff out there to worry about. You don't have to you don't have to be a, you know, overly hand wringing Washington insider to see this. So the risk. So let's just talk about what if I I mean, if Biden took your advice and I guess my advice and more importantly, the American public's uh, the Democratic voters advice, Democratic Party voters advice and said, OK, you know, I'm going to be a great one, good one, do my best to be really, really good one term president, finish all the work. Uh, as much of the work I can I can do on the economy and uh, right. make sure Ukraine wins, and but I'm not going to run for re-election. He announced that in a month. What would it look like? I mean, how does it, what what would you expect the primary process to look right. like? The candidates, the, et cetera. The first thing that would happen is approval would go up three to five points immediately. I agree. Okay, with that. immediately. Yeah, you know, and and he has and he has very skilled people around him, and and. But they all work for him. All right. It, it, one of the things that people say is Biden really doesn't have any peers. He's got – Mike Donlin is an old, old friend of mine. is one of the more skilled people day in and day out in this business, I know. But Anita Dunn is highly experienced, highly skilled. Rochetti's a, you know, a, a really good guy. He's not he, – he's a smart guy. But they work for him. That there's no one can come in and say, "Sir, this is this thing is just not where we need it to be." For quite frankly, that that I don't think that exists in Biden world. Uh, but let's just assume that he decided that he didn't, and it, said, uh, "You know, I'm going to sit here. I, I promise to do this job. I'm going to stay on the job right to the end. I'm going to, you know, help my friend President Zelensky in Ukraine. I'm going to forge our better ties with." South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, which I think is really smart and good. And uh, we're going to keep pushing this economy forward. We've made great progress and we're making progress. And I want to sit on as long as my watch. I, I, I think that and then a bunch of people would announce it. I think you would see crowds of 10, 15,000 people in Iowa, in New Hampshire, South Carolina. And I, th I think there would be just enormous do I know that? No. Can I prove that? No. But do I honestly think that? Yes. And let them all run. It's so the, the 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 thing that I really deeply disagree with is when people say, well, if it's not Biden, the only alternative we have is Harris. Oh no, please. There is more the most skilled presidential field of our lifetime, I think it was clearly the 1980 Republicans. But they were skilled in a different way. If you took the, the accumulated government experience of that field, it, it was pretty remarkable. Yeah. All right. I think the potential Democratic 2024 skill field could even be better. Not that they had the same kind of experience, but the skill. Josh Shapiro is such a skilled politician. It's like ridiculous. Right. It'd be the same thing with Whitman. That he wouldn't be presidential with here. Andy Andy Bashir is so freaking skilled. He would Westmore, Warnock, Gina Ramout. I don't if I, I I hate to start naming names because somebody called and you say, Well, you didn't mention me. And that that, that uh, uh, about Newsom, uh, you, you know, Harris starts out as a you know, she's got her problems, but you know, she's one vice president, prosecutor, attorney general. I mean, I just, my, my point is, that, don't worry. There's plenty of people to pick up the ball. And, you know, De Gaulle, they went to him and he told his staff he was not going to run for free election. And people said, well, monsieur, what, what's France going to do without you? How can, how can France live without De Gaulle since, you know, the late 30s? He said the graveyards are full of indispensable people. But you want to you see people at the country can't do without? Go buy any graveyard in Washington. They all laugh. Yeah, that's okay. A, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt died. You know what the country did? Survived. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, come on. 
Yeah, no, very fair, a fair point. I mean, I would say incidentally, you mentioned Shapiro and Whitmer, and again, let's not, yeah, I, don't, I agree with you. We don't need to go through the uh, Buddha judge. I mean, everyone's going to go to Klobuchar. It'll be, you know, who knows? Right. But but those two in particular, they won in swing states that Biden had won by right. a point or two, by, I guess, 10 points in Whitmer's case, 15 points in Shapiro. Discounted a little because uh, Shapiro in particular had a crazy opponent. Whitmer actually had a, a normal from being a right. Republican opponent. And let's just say, and let's stipulate winning a governor's race doesn't the same as winning a presidential race and right, Trump is a different kind of opponent. But I feel like people who say well, only Biden can win, it's like, didn't Whitmer and Shapiro literally win several percentage point of Trump voters in 2022? I mean, by yeah, definition, well. they couldn't have won by that margin if they didn't get people who had voted for Trump in 2020. So they have at least some track record, Warnock and Georgia, too. Two Warnockers. Getting, Warnock getting Warnock voters, getting voters, getting voters who voted for Kemp. You know what I mean? So. They, they haven't. Biden's not the only Democrat who has a track record of winning over Republicans or ex-Republicans or independents. I mean, now presidential level is different. I understand that. But right. so I feel like there's a yes, the, the Washington conventional wisdom that, oh, my God, what a horrible risk for to have any of those people. Well, you went through this in 91, 92 with Clinton, of course. Right. right? I mean, you know, he can't have right. some untested governor from Arkansas against right. against George H.W. Bush, who was winning the Cold War and the Gulf War. And. Um, I don't know if I ever told you I remember this. I'll just sit, take two seconds. Right. This meeting in the White House, I think it was in the White House. Maybe it was you know outside the White House, but it was about politics. Maybe it was at the Hay Adams. Like, very late in 91, but Sununu was still chief of staff. And it was when, so that was December, I think, when Cuomo didn't fly to New Hampshire. It was, decided, it was December. It was right, tough, decided yes. not to run. And huge size of relief from the Bush high command, both in the White House and in the campaign. The late Bob Teeter was a wonderful guy. Uh, included in this, but especially Sununu. Just, just, oh my God, can you imagine they're going to be nominating Clinton? Oh boy, we're lucky to avoid Cuomo. And I, uh, you know, foolishly sort of said, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's tougher to run against a guy who wins in Arkansas, who seems like a skilled Paul. And I knew Clinton a little bit uh, when I worked at the education department and Hillary was on an advisory committee and stuff. I met him a few times, a skilled politician from Arkansas, then to run against the New York liberal governor. And oh no, Bill, you don't understand how politics works. And we have all these governors in the Midwest who are going to hold those states for us against Clinton. I don't know. So it, people are surprisingly are often wrong about who the strongest opponents would be, especially if they're in Washington and sort of swept up in it's the incumbent president strong and or the governor of New York strong. And you know, so who are these other governors who people don't have don't know at this point, right? You, you know, Bill, it, it, that that's like uh to turn out to my then girlfriend that I was going to work for Bill Clinton. She literally threw up and she said, he's done. He, that guy can beat us. I, I mean, people, yeah. yourself, people knew. I mean, maybe. No, I remember talking some, to her. Yeah. yeah people, Mary at the time was one of the few said, people who saw what, what was going on. Right. And said, yeah. you know, this guy, in, in, this guy's dangerous. You know, if you let this, in, you let this horse get out the barn and prance around the pasture a little bit, it's not going to be good. And I was, a very hot property. And so I interviewed Harkin and Bob Carey and whoever was running. And as soon as you talk to Clinton, I mean, this was like, holy shit. <laughs> Is that right? Is yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you had was, won the big Pennsylvania special. You had won the big Senate Pennsylvania race. race. And Paul Begal and I were the hot commodities and all the campaigns then were calling and us. And did you not have much of a prior relationship with Clinton? Not much at all. I, he, well, when I was doing a Frank Loudenberg campaign, he spoke at the the JJ dinner, and uh, as actually Zell Miller, the, the Democratic governor of Georgia at the time, and he told then Governor Clinton, "You got to talk to the, you got to talk to James and Paul. These guys are really, really good." So I didn't have, I didn't go in with, with much of a relationship, but I, I was able to interview, and all of them talked to me, and it was just evident there was the whole other level of, of politics that you were dealing with. Uh, you know, one of the things that people say that I I find, let's say, mildly annoying is like the Democrats, you know, thought that Reagan would be the best. Or the Republicans, you know, said, who are the Democrats? I mean, somebody says the Democrats wanted, would you describe to me? Because, I mean, I think I know a lot of Democrats. And I don't think you can find if you find five Democrats, you find six opinions. I, I, or people say the Republicans want that. Well, actually, who are? What? Tell me who the is Matt Gates and uh, Mitt Romney. Are they the same people? 
I, 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 it's just it, it's it's one of the uh, it's nothing significant. I just find it no, irritating no, when yeah. people just ascribe the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, the, it, it's a shorthand, but it's meaningless. Well, or they think there's a Democratic Party that can make X or Y right, happen. Right, Why isn't the right. party going to Biden and tell who is the party? A lot of people who yeah. work for Biden, uh, a lot of people who depend on Biden to raise, you know, do fundraisers for them and get along with the White House and get favors, not favors, but get genuine things done for their constituents and so forth. And so why won't those people go to Biden? Because Biden's the president of the United States, right? Right. It, oh, every day I get stopped. Every day I'm traveling. I get stopped in the airport. And people, and it's good. I've kind of cultivated image. And people come up to me and just, James, you know, why don't you go to the DNC and tell them to do that? I say, well, first of all, I don't know if they listen to me. Second, if they tried to do it, they couldn't do it anyway. So, I mean, you, 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 the idea that I could make like my children, what what do you mean we can't get in this restaurant? Of course we can. You know, mm-hmm. get daddy to call. Right? <laughs> that, that people think I've, I have powers that I have no way of near having. I just pick up the phone. You pick up the phone and you call Joe Biden and you tell him, say, here, you take the phone. I got my cell right there. You call it. <laughs> but it, it, it just, it, it is funny the, the, how people think you are the, are the Democratic Party or the DNC. Yeah, I mean, it, they, they don't know whether the DNC has never known whether to wind its butt, butt or scratch its watch. They're still trying to figure it out, you know. <laughs> this is disillusioning to me that you don't have this power, though. I've always assumed you did, you know. When yeah, I was the RNC Republicans. used to have power. When yeah, I actually, started, the Republicans are a little different. Yeah, there well, is a little yeah, more. When I started dating, I used to go over to RNC, and Clayton Yider was the RNC chairman, purpose, fine gentleman, nice guy, like a Nebraska, nice. like an egg guy. Yeah. And he was the first Republican chairman to refer to it as the Democratic Party and not the Democrat Party. And they asked him why. And he said, well, a political party has a right to be called what it wants to be called, which is, you know, OK, <laughs> kind of makes sense if you think about it. It's, it was a different uh, he short was a, lived. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right, he was right. A nice, yeah, he was a nice But they guy. had power, the RNC and Right. 1991, was, they could raise money, they could do things, they were organized. DNC, Ron Brown was the best party chair we ever had. Is that right? Yeah, that's interesting. I yeah. So. so I'd say the I was having this conversation with someone in Washington. I said, yeah, but you're right, Phil, probably better on the whole. The risks of Biden running at 82 are greater than the risks of the contentious primary. And so just one more footnote on the contentious primary before I get to the next point I want to make about whether someone should challenge Biden. People also like are crazy about that. It's like, it's going to be bitter. It's going to be mean. It's going to be like, there's no correlation. A, mm. yes, yeah, sort of. B, it's not going to be that bitter. They're all going to be kind of pro-Biden, obviously, when they run. And C, people, it happens. It ends. There's a convention. Everyone gets together. And with very rare exceptions, it doesn't affect anything in the general. The 2016, was, Karl Rove said on Fox News at the height of the Obama Clinton, 2008, I'm sorry, thing which was going on forever and Hillary wouldn't give up and they were primaries where Hillary was beating Obama late in key big states, Pennsylvania and stuff. And Carl wrote, this is dooming the Democrats. This is really going to damage them. And I remember saying, I don't think so. You know, they're all, all the Obama voters would vote for Clinton and all the Clinton voters would vote for Obama with one or two exceptions, obviously. But I mean, and, and there's not much evidence. The Republicans had a pretty nasty pro- set of primaries in 2015, 16. It wasn't like Trump had a, you know, a lot of a lot of people denounce Trump much more fervently than they have since, of course. And Trump won. And then once he's the nominee, he's the nominee. And unfortunately, he won. So I, I feel like this whole contentious primary bitterness, it's going to be a zoo. That's just, I don't know. Do you agree that that's so yeah, overdone, yeah. I think? Right. Not only is it overdone. So uh, I'll do an experiment with you. Ask Sarah Longwell, your friend who's very confident, that does a lot of focus group, does yep. a lot of posts. And if so, and so, what do you, when you go to, well, you know, you don't pick anything, Wisconsin, is, you know, yeah. Pennsylvania, and ask people when you think of the Democratic Party, what do you think of? They're going to say urban, uh, very into minorities, old. Uh, you know, they don't really see me. I don't really. They're not really part of the equation, and they, you know, they think of. Pelosi and Biden and, and this is your idea of what the Democratic Party is. So you turn on the TV and there's a debate. And they got Whitmer and Warnock and JB Pritzker and you know, five other Gavin Newsom. And there are five people there that got a lot of energy. 
that can really string a sentence together that have, well, you know, I kind of like that idea. Yeah. All right. That, yeah. and it, but, but, but right now, if you, if you ask Sarah, I know what she's going to tell you. They think it's, it's an urban, old, very political, into constituency groups. In, you, you can't blame people for that. But, but the point is when people see, holy shit, these people actually have thought of this. It, 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 I think it would change sea level. I really do. And, and you think that the reason I have such a soft spot for Whitman is because she so destroyed the Michigan Republican Party. They had a fist fight at the state convention. Right. If, if somebody in a swing state can get the opposition party to start, you know, throwing knuckle sandwiches at each other at, at the state convention, that's pretty good. <laughs> and the Michigan Republican Party was a powerful entity right. at one time. Really powerful. It's now babbling in the corner, you know, d- doesn't know which way to go. Even like Betsy DeVos has had enough of them. And and you can thank Whitmer for a large part of that. Yeah, and they won the town ballot races and they won the legislature. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, yeah. Shapiro, yeah, and, Pennsylvania, and, too, was a very tough yeah, state. Sure. And, he, when, and by the way, Shapiro had something to do. That was the big thing about the Democrats getting involved in these Republican primaries. I, I was totally supportive of it. And they gave Mastriano over good shove in the right direction. And it turned out to be pretty damn good politics because they were able to. The other thing, Bill, I'd point out, the Democrats have literally not lost an election since since Dobbs. And and everyone, even if they did, they've outperformed 10, 15 points. And not only are they winning, they're winning by a lot more than they should. Now, whether you can say that it's not going to continue, I I can't tell you that, but I can't tell you there's been a bunch of elections in different parts of the country uh, that have were supposed to be close and not even close. Yeah. And that's, and that's also, I think Whitmer used that effectively. And it's probably yeah. better for a governor who's in a state with actual abortion legislation having been debated and so forth to make raise that issue. Then Biden, it's a little, you know, I mean, he's, he's where the yeah, party you, is on it. He's fine, but it's, it's not quite his, you know, <laughs> Yes, Charlie Sykes, if you ever thought a political party could win an election in Wisconsin by 12 points, and they said, no, it's impossible. No? And now the Republicans are trying to yeah, yeah. prevent her from being a, a judge. But so yeah. let's get to the tougher case, though. So I, uh, you and I are certainly in the same place on Biden stepping aside and uh, have been for quite a while. Is it crazy? Would it be crazy for someone who probably wouldn't be one of the really famous governors, but maybe a backbench member of Congress or something? To say, look, the country deserves a choice. I have the highest regard for President Biden, but I'm going to, you know, throw my hat in the ring just so there is a lead. Try to break the ice. Try to rip the Band-Aid off. Or is that a bad idea? So this has never happened. It'd be clear. There's nothing specific. But let's say I was in the Washington area and a Democratic politician of some session said, James, I'd like to have lunch with you. And he said, look, I, I'll she said, it's not a secret. I've been bought this because I'm ambitious. Thank you. I, I like that. Very, very, very approving of that. And, and, and I want to run for president one day. And I'm going I'm to wait to 2028. And I would say to them, generic, pick any five credible people. I'd say, I'm going to give you my honest answer. If your view of the world is I'm not going to challenge Biden because it would disrupt the party. It, it would. Clyburn would be mad at me. It, it, whatever. Yeah, I, I just, I, 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 I donors, you know, and, and people genuinely like Joe Biden during the Democratic Party for good reason. Okay, guys, if you want to be president, 2028 is the worst possible year you can run as a Democrat. The Democratic feel in 2028 is going to be stunningly good because then you're going to have the Shapiros and the Westmores and people like that coming online that they're probably a cycle away. So if you want to if you want to be president and you're a Democrat, your best chance is to run right now. You have a much better chance. It, you know, you're telling me that you're an ambitious person. All right. You're telling me that this is something you want to do. You think you can do the job. And I'm telling you with as much certainty as a human being can have, your chances in 2024 are significantly better than it'd be in 2028. The primary would be incredibly hard. The general would be incredibly hard. 
I mean, just look forward. Yeah, right. Because the theory is, is Biden will win and this, uh, no, no, I, I would be very comfortable in giving any Democrat that that piece of advice. And do you think I've made this argument once or twice to Demo- Democrats don't even they're so nervous about it. They don't even raise it directly, but it's always like a hypothetical if someone were to possibly think of doing this. I, I think it's also the case that if someone, Mr. and Mrs. X announced against announced in a month in a respectful way, I, I just feel like people deserve a choice. Let's say Biden beats that person. Which he could well do, obviously, if it's not a well-known person, and if other people don't jump in, and you know, Biden wins South Carolina sixty thirty-five, and or sixty, you know, fifty-five thirty-five with Kennedy and Williamson getting some votes, and then he wins the subsequent races and so forth. Isn't Biden stronger as a result of that, not weaker? Wouldn't it be a little invigorating to, for Biden to knock aside some challengers, as opposed to the notion that the show, all it can do is weaken Biden? I don't really quite buy that. I, 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 I have heard this argument again and again, and it makes sense. I don't know of any politician that wants to be primary. No, I understand that. Uh, okay. Understand. This is, understand. You don't understand this, but this this is going to be good for you. They don't want it, but I'm just saying I understand. Empirically, I agree. I think, uh, empirically, less, empirically, everyone's into 1980. Oh, Kennedy destroyed so, Carter. Right. You know, I went back and looked at that. It's not if Kennedy had not run. Can I just make this point? In 1980, Jimmy Carter would have lost around. He had lost anyway. Yeah, Absolutely. it's, like, it's a it silly a moment. I, Kennedy it, ran a tough campaign and didn't really concede very gracefully right. and mobilized the whole wing of the party. This wouldn't be like that. This would be a respectful yeah. campaign. Time to move on, time to the generational so, transfer that you promised, sir. You know, I, I really feel like people are overdoing how much damage it would do. So when people want to change, you're not going to talk them out of it. 1980, 1992. It, 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 it's all totally. gone off. They, they, they wanted a, a new generation, they wanted a new leadership that had 12 years. It, I mean, and I'm saying this because I get credit for something that was going to happen anyway. I think I think we can get some credit for the primaries. Yeah. 2008 was the same thing. But John McCain could have stood on his head eating cornflakes and recited the Iliad. It wouldn't have mattered. They, they, they weren't going to vote for it. I mean, they were just in the mood for something else. I don't know. I think the country is just hungry, just hungry for something different. And I do I'm very confident in that assessment. And you look at, it's not that I think, so I think this, I want to be 79. I've certainly been around the presidency and been inside of it. You older guy, you've been, you know, you worked in the White House. You have some idea of what the job entails, but it doesn't matter. No one is sitting here waiting. Say, well, I got to wait and see what Bill and James think. And then I'll, I'll know what I think. That, that's just not, Fucking way unfortunately, unfortunately, that's yeah, unfortunately, not yeah, if they yeah. would just listen to us. But we do know how, what the public thinks. That we do. This is not a secret. And we do know what they think over an accumulated number of polls. And, you know, some say 75 don't like the choice. Some say 72. Some say 77. It's all the same number. I mean, and it just is. There's just no denying that. Yeah. And people, my friends in the White House, who sort of stopped talking to me the last two, three weeks. But until recently, it was so, Bill, you have this fantasy about, you know, a younger candidate and so forth. But we're going to do a better job of messaging. And Biden deserves credit for all the good things he's done. And I agree he deserves more credit than he's getting. Right. But at some point, you also have to accept, this is kind of your point, I think, uh, another way of saying it, accept what the data is showing you. And I was there in that Bush White House in 91, 92. George H.W. Bush was a pretty good president. You know, history, history has been kind to him and will be kind right. to him. And the country wanted change after 12 years. And I remember going out and making the case for Bush, you know, when I was Quail's VP, uh, Chief of Staff, uh, uh, Vice President Quail's right. Chief of Staff. And, uh, you know, it, it just at some point I kind of realized it, it sort of doesn't matter. I mean, they're going to, and suddenly that's, if they couldn't vote for Clinton, they were going to vote for Pro, right? And so okay. Bush went, I always think this is as thick as telling, Bush went from 54%, I think it was in 1988, to 38% in 92. Think about that. A, a quarter, a third of, of Bush's voters deserted him. And, had he been that bad? But it's just people want to change. And I kind of feel like we're a little bit in that. I mean, obviously Biden's only been president for four years. There hasn't been 12 straight years of democratic governance and so forth. But uh, I don't know. I, I think at some point the so, Biden people are are trying to argue with something that it's pretty hard to argue your way out of. So, so 
you know, also look at Churchill. I mean, he's like 48. I mean, the guy could make any kind of argument you wanted to make, and right. people wanted to change. Yeah. It's, it's one of these things where I, I once, rare time I had a job, I went in and told the person I was working for that about who's going to leave, and, you know, was polite, nice about it, and that person told call me ungrateful and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, sir, if everything that you say is right, it might be. And everything that I say is wrong, and that's not, I consider that to be the possibility, it don't make a shit, I'm still quitting. I'm really not here to argue about it, all right? So it, sometimes in politics, and this happens more often than we think, everything that the, op, the, other, the other people say is absolutely true. All right, manufacturing has been, you know, George H.W. Bush, we, 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 want, we stopped an invasion without, you know, a minimal cost, we made real progress to balance the budget. We, we we did the Clean Water Act, the ADA Act. The, the, right. the, you go back and you say, you know, gee, it was a more, you know, even people go back and look at the Carter presidency and say, well, it was more accomplished than, than we thought. It didn't matter. They, they, they weren't even in, they weren't open to judging on that. And when somebody, when they say Biden is too old, what I can't do legitimately is say, let's pivot to the right to the real issues. Let's talk about infrastructure. Let's talk about education. Let's talk about the alliances around the world. No, it's a real issue. I can't say this is something that they're making up on Fox. Age. Right? Age. Age. Yeah. It's an issue. And everybody has experience with it. Uh, everybody knows what it is. And I, I, and you can't. In the press, most people I talk to in the press, actually, the White House screams at them. They think they're actually, if anything, undercovering the issue. Hmm. But you can't say it's just some made up Glenn Beck, you know, Ovington window bullshit that they come up with. It's actually, a, it's actually but an issue. <laughs> you can't say that it's going to be less of an issue a year from now. It, it, it doesn't, I, I, you and I know, it, it, it's an elevator that only goes down. The, the, the best you can do is stop at a floor for some period of time, but it's not going to go back up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm struck when we talked, when we talked about the Democratic Party, asking about the Democratic Party for a minute, more broadly, was um, when we talked in April, I think it was 2021. I think you were worried about the left wing streak in the party, and you made a, a comment that got a lot of pickup about you know they should stop listening so much to people from the Amst Amherst. I think it was faculty lounge, and you know, and uh, listen to real voters and not worry about Latinx and stuff. When we spoke at the beginning of 2023, January 23, you were somewhat more optimistic that that had receded some, and the moderates sort of had and uh, had were getting the upper hand, Biden, obviously part of that, but also Shapiro, Whitmer and others, some of the younger members of Con AOC doesn't seem to be quite representative of the younger members of Congress, maybe Spanberger right. and Slotkin and Mikey Sherrill and uh, Seth Moulton and uh, Dean Phillips and people like that are more representative. And where are you now on sort of the internal balance right. of power, as it were, and dynamics of the Democratic Party? So I, I, I don't to, to, to allow me to take a few minutes here. Yeah. The word woke first appeared by a black jazz musician who was born in Caddo Parish, I think Shreveport, died in a Houston jail named Lead Belly Lead Belly. Right. And it was used in a context that black people in Louisiana and Texas in the 1920s should be woke in their interactions with the police. Which seems to me is pretty sound advice. Okay, I thought was a black person in, in Houston in 1928, but it, it, yeah, I guess it, they tell you the military situational awareness <laughs> would be a good idea. All right, and of course, overeducated, the Amherst Humanities faculty got a hold to the word and then came up with woke because overeducated white people screw everything up for everybody. Right? Mm. I, I I do think that. My side is one no argument. Now, are they going to come up and say we were naive and we, we were trying to apply 22nd century terminology to the present time, which was probably an overreach? They're never going to say that. But 
they're kind of letting it go. It, but so what's really become the extreme is the anti-woke. Everything is woke. Woke corporations, woke military, woke highway signs, woke I, I, anything you can think of. And when it reached its zenith, earlier this week, I, I read a column in the New York Times. It says, James Bond has gone woke. Mm -hmm. I went, oh, Jesus Christ. Now, now James Bond is like transgender, you know, multiracial. Uh, hey, I, the evidence is he's dating a, a new James Bond book. He's dating an immigration lawyer. Oh, Jesus. That, you know, so <laughs> yeah, son comes home and says, I'm dating an immigration lawyer. Great. <laughs> we, we need him. Or that the, 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 you know, Victor Orban was the villain in the book. Actually, he's a pretty bad guy. Yeah, right. He's a pretty <laughs> good villain. Yeah, yeah. yeah, pretty good villain. And so it's become to the extent that the anti-woke, the, the woke people are not going to sit. They, they, they're not going to mess with me or Bill Maher or anybody else. It, but, but, oh, if you're the assistant instructor of art history at some, you know, overpriced, under attended college, they'll hang you up in the, in the town square. All right. It, they, they would thrive on people that couldn't defend themselves against this, what I consider excessive and sometimes ridiculous language. But the big thing is the public never picked it up. They, they were using words. I'm, I'm not a, a, a linguistic guy at all. But for for word to have some power, people have to start picking it up and using. And the the things that the, the, I mean, every people, everybody knew what. If I could unring a bell, I, 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 I'm very pleased with what I said about it. But in I think that anti woke people have now become the true villains in this. But understand yeah. this, and you know, you know this. The Western left, now I'm not talking about liberals like me, I'm talking about the left, are colossally stupid throughout history. And I, I point to the German communists, we're marching and saying, the worse the better, after Hitler, us. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> and where did you all end up? <laughs> all right. and, and so there was this kind of thing in the American left that was very quite pleased that Trump won. And their theory is, is that there's all these inactive cells of the proletariat stationed strategically around the country that are ready to be activated at the touch of a button. And if we if, if we actually got all of a, we had high voter turnout and people turn out, we would win every election. Actually, people at researchers say, if anything, there's more dormant, potentially right wing voters than they are left wing. And actually, to the extent that, that there's any research on it, but that's that's their belief that the worse it gets. And I first encountered these people in Austin in 1984. I'd never heard of that. That it, you, you lose with honor. You feel better about yourself. You didn't get there and start compromising and dealing with these people who are historically supported inequities in society. And it, 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 it's such a, a weird thing to a guy like me. But they, 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 they exist, and there are more of them than you think, and you're going to find a lot of them on Cornell West's campaign. They will be happy if, if they elect, re-elect Trump, because that just... That accelerates. You know, these racists talk, they, they call themselves accelerationists, that there's got there's a race war that's coming and that we just as soon get it over with and get it done right now. But the left has its accelerationists too. That that inevitably there's going the the, the workers are gonna rise up and seize control with the means of production. And you just wait, I'm right, and the worse it gets, the more likely this is gonna happen. That, now, I promise you that that's a phenomenon. Yeah, it's not going away. It's going to be a part of the Democratic, the any left left party, right. liberal party. But I do feel like, yeah, the, as you say, the Democrat, just again, if you look empirically at 
Shapiro and Whitmer and Polis and Pritzker, they have their slight differences of gradation, but that does not look like a super left, super woke party. And and, and if no. you look at Schumer and Jeffries and no, Clark, and I mean, so I, I and Biden, of course, no. and, and Tony Blinken and Janet Yellen. No, Yellen no, I, not, not, not remotely. So. Not, it, it, but look at the Republicans. So you, you, See, you, so let's you, talk about the Republicans, because I feel yeah. like that's, and when there thought, where's the Republican establishment finally going to come back and assert itself? And in fact, the Republicans are the ones who've gone, I think, as you said about anti-woke, who've gone where they've been unable to to defeat or contain or keep in check the radical elements, to say the least. I mean, look at McCarthy. OK, try not to. In, in this impeachment inquiry. So it reminds me of the first LSU president. Minor historical figure by the name of W.T. Sherman marches into Atlanta. And he's informed that John Bell Hood has taken the Confederate Army North. And he said, Great, I'll send him rations if he wants it. Mm -hmm. uh, the first encounter they had was at Franklin. It, did, it didn't end well. <laughs> it, it really didn't end well. And Kevin McCarthy is marching the Republican Army right into Franklin, Tennessee. And you're going to have the same result. Because what's going to happen, Bill? First of all, James Comer is not a very bright man. Let's just be frank about it. Okay, I kind of is this some kind of arrogance against Western Kentucky? Actually, no. But he's just not. I don't care where he's from. Uh, Jim Jordan has got issues. Let me tell you, Dan Goldman, that uh, Plaskett, that the, the Virgin Islands delegate person, yeah. uh, Jamie Raskin, they're they, they're smart. They're good lawyers. They, they're going to eat these people alive. They just literally, you know, they, McCarthy and Matt Gates, and them, they are marching their army right into the Union Center at Franklin. Do you think they're really marching them, or is it a fake? I mean, I think McCarthy's just trying to keep. Well, could McCarthy be trying to keep his base happy? But he's not really launching an impeachment inquiry. He's just telling the committees to keep doing what they're doing. Or do you think the momentum now is there? But, but to... in the public's mind, yeah, fair. And fair point. everybody's going to start covering. Yeah, they're going to they, they, they're going to start covering, it. and then they, the, the Democrats are going to say, "Well, you got to bring these witnesses in." I, this is a win again. This is a winning issue, and he looks. I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, and I, I said he, he was a tragic figure, and he corrected me because I think you're more schooled in classics than I am. A tragic is something bad that happens, and the person knows it's happening to him. That's interesting. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. a. Pathetic character is something this has happened to him and they don't even know it. <laughs> All right. It, I think McCarthy, in, in that classical definition, is more pathetic. He, but his, his goal is to be in power tomorrow. If, we'll worry about it a year from now. And if, if he thinks that by doing this, he's going to get their votes on a budget to not shut the government down. He's 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 not tragic. He's pathetic. And that is what well, maybe we should close with this. But one thing that we were talking at the very beginning about unexpected things that could happen and whatever. And I mean, they will. There's going to be a pretty big fights about a bunch of things on Capitol Hill. Those don't always affect the presidential race much. You know, they kind of come and go and it's like a storm that happens and then everyone forgets about it. But I don't know if they really try to shut down funding for Ukraine, if they really shut the government down, if they really do the impeachment inquiry. I guess that could affect the overall political climate going forward, right? So it, it, it certainly is not going to help them. Right? It, it may be it, it, my view of the battle of Franklin, might be, but it's not going to help them. And But the real problem they have the real problem is the Supreme Court. Hmm. I guess people don't like Dobbs. They don't like the gun stuff. I'm sorry, no, they really don't like the gun stuff. And the ethics stuff is taking hold. And some Democrat is going to be smart enough to say, I'm going to propose legislation to the Supreme Court that's subjected to the same rules that every federal district judge in the United States is subjected to. Who disagrees with that? OK, oh, well, you know, Article three is established. And, you know, OK, please don't get that. Yeah. So you, you're telling me that. Judge such and such has to file all of this, but justice so and so doesn't. What's American about that? Right. And you know, talk of the 
you know, Article 3 to you drop. You're not going to win that argument. And then what this arrogance has led to is taking away a 50 year right. What it's led to is kowtowing to the gun industry. What it's led to is, is you know, a few billionaire daughters having all the act. And people are t- that's totally believable. All right. That, that's not even a leap for people to take. I'm just waiting till somebody figures out in a national sense how to get this issue front and center. Because it's a it's it's and it's working. We just like I said, we don't lose. I was the only national Democrat that actually went to Kansas to campaign for the no vote. And I I, I I had a feeling this, you know, this was a kind of strategic move on my part. You know, A, I was one of the few national Democrats that would let in. And I I had a feeling this thing was going to work. I didn't think it was going to work out to the extent that it did. But people just don't, they don't like being, you know. Some of the liberals have learned this whole period of time. Once you tell people they can't do something, it just makes them want to do it more. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, it does feel like it's a it's a moment of great worry and alarm for some of us. And Biden looks not, like not a very strong, not the, as you say, he would probably lose if the election were tomorrow against Trump. It might, well, on the other hand, it's kind of a moment of opportunity for Democrats, including, and for moderate, if I can put it this way, uh, FDR, Hubert Humphrey, Bill Clinton Democrats, because- right. You're right. I mean, the issue, a lot of the issues line up pretty well for them. And it doesn't look like the Republicans are going to liberate themselves from their Trumpist extreme very soon. Maybe if Trump loses in 24, but even then, it's pretty deeply baked in it, it feels like. Yeah. J- just ask your friend Sarah Longwell. Look at what people say about the party and then take the people right. that you know that are out there, the Whitmers, the Shapiros, the Warnocks, the whoever they are. And they were totally introduced. The, the most influential part of the Democratic Party are, are actually blacks. And older blacks are very conservative. But Jim, Jim Clyburn famously says, most conservative person I ever knew was my dad. Right. And they don't like shiny new objects. They're, they're not into that. They into, you know, it's the old thing. They don't want someone that talks to talk. They want someone that's walk to walk. And and, and they like Biden because Biden has walked. I mean, right. they're, they're, let me say there's many wonderful things to say about Joe Biden, not just as a human being, but as a president. But the timing is everything. No, he will be, he could go down in history as a very successful president. I think he will actually at this moment. And if he keeps it to four years, I think he's a very good chance of it. Running for re-election, yeah. that's another question, oh, right? We'll it's, see. Diff- it's hard to separate for people in Washington. Right. You know, right. Right. The notion that you can be a successful president and you might not be the best candidate. But of course, that's empirically, they are different yeah. things, right? Yeah, they are very different things. And I, like I say, if he decided not to run, I think it's approval. For, I, I would bet go up four and a half points. Interesting. That, that's just a guess. I, I don't know, anybody can make any guess they want. We may never know the answer. Well, I, mean, I think your point about the focus groups with Sarah, you know, is also right. that if to the degree that people have a perception of the party that's here and uh, reality is here, I, I, that I reality know the reality can break, can break through if there's an actual. I, I, they are of, of the Democrats, and I'm seeing any number of poll, and it comes in somewhere between probably nine and 13 or 14 percent, describe themselves as progressive liberal. It's a, it's a, it's a, oh, oh, that's of the entire party. So when we, we you talk about the wokes are a very much a minority part of the Democratic Party. The MAGA are a majority of the Republican Party. And so when people say, well, James, you know, yeah, look, we got our crazies, but admit that you have your crazies too. That's fine, but but that's not the same thing. 10% is not the same thing as 63%. It's two different numbers. All right. And and by the way. Our the woke people are just kind of naive and goofy. So if your daughter, I don't know, you know, if there's somebody who's marrying a, a, a wokey, you know, I probably disagree with them, but they're not fundamentally bad people. The people that saw in the Capitol are fundamentally rotten, freaking people. Okay, they're bad people. They're, they're criminals. It's not one is goofy and kind of out of touch and doesn't really understand the country or other people. The other people are, are genuinely bad people. <laughs> it's a difference. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, well, a non-old, non-woke Democratic Party could be pretty, could be an impressive party, I, I think. And and uh, 
that part is so undercovered. I mean, just to close with that, I mean, the degree to right. which you have, in effect, a much more traditional Democratic Party that's uh, shrugged off a lot of the pacifism and utopianism about foreign policy. I think it's shrugged off some of the big government stuff to some degree. I mean, it's not like, and it's been responsible mostly on economic yeah. policy, not entirely, some denial there on inflation and so forth. But um, anyway, it's, okay. it's it is what it is, right? It is. Yeah, I always enjoy doing the uh, podcast. James, this has been deal. great, and thank you for doing it. All right, you uh, bet. And we'll we'll do it again. And after Absolutely. Biden takes your, I'm going to have you on the day after President Biden, <laughs> six weeks from now, announces that he's not running. He's listened to James yeah. Carville. Uh, James he, Carville placed a private call to him late at night on his cell phone, and he convinced right. him. And we're going to have a vigorous <laughs> and exciting Democratic primary and defeat Trump in 24. Uh, and after uh, that, uh, uh, we'll, 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 uh, do, uh, we'll do that. We'll do we'll do a version of that. We'll do the show. Uh, we'll do the next conversation the next day after. And that. we'll both be six. 65 again and be happy. Thank you, man. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you, James. Thank you all for joining us on Conversations.